Well, that's one way to adjourn a trial. I can't believe they took Mr. Right away for questioning. <sighs> the last thing they needed was Daddy being taken behind bars. At least he's not a direct suspect for now. Still, what on earth was the Masked Stranger's gear doing inside his bag? That's for us to find out, Polly. I guess the good thing is that we definitely know where to start our final day of investigation. <sighs> yeah, we should check up on Mr. Wright as soon as we can. If we're lucky, we might be able to talk to Mr. Porter as well. Mr. Wright said he'd tell us more about the AC3 case after the trial, so that might also give us some new information. What's for certain is that we need to get the story from the boss himself. Back at the old detention center again. Same old walls, same old guard on duty. Can I help you? Yes, you can. We're here to see Mr. Wright. He was brought in not too long ago. I see. I'll go get him for you. One moment, please. Ah, you're here. For a second there, I thought that you'd forgotten all about me. Daddy, are you alright? I have to admit, I like the accommodation at the Royal Flush a whole lot more. The service in this place leaves a lot to be desired. Truth be told, I didn't expect to get to play against Jack quite so soon. But since we're both on this side of the screen now, I might as well make the most of it. I managed to have a quick chat with him on the way here, so he's brought me up to speed with the details of today's trial. Good work, you two. Seems everything is just fine with Mr. Wright. That's a relief. Did you talk about... anything else? Not really. But I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to chat soon. How is Mr. Porter doing, by the way? Jack's fine. He's in questioning right now, though. And I'd wager that I'll be getting the good cop, bad cop treatment next. I hear they're looking into whether the two of us have been conspiring during the case. Well, have you? <laughs> yes. I was going to sneak Jack a bottle of sparkling grape juice to celebrate the new year with. However, murder was not a part of our planned festivities. I'm as innocent as he is. That much was obvious, but it's still a relief to hear him say it. Crazier things have happened. Nevertheless, I bet you two are probably aching to get to the meat of things after that little turnabout. Daddy, you're not really the masked stranger, right? And no jokes this time. <laughs> Don't worry, sweetie. I most certainly am not. I have no clue who the Masked Stranger is, nor have I ever worn their outfit. In that case, do you have any ideas on how the Masked Stranger's suit ended up in your duffel bag of all places? You mean, other than me obviously stashing it in there? Other than that, yes. Well, I'll tell you this. As you might recall, Miss Garnet asked me to play the piano for the dress rehearsal of the Midnight Jazz Stravaganza. They ended up not needing my services, 
but I was asked to stay as a mock audience member to give them feedback. And that's what I did. Would have been rude to say no. I'm sure you had plenty of objections to getting a private burlesque show. And you had your duffel bag with you the entire time? Of course not. That would have been silly. Since the stage crew were busy setting things up, Miss Garnet asked me to leave the bag in her dressing room so it wouldn't get in their way. So that's what I did. I told her I'd pick it up later after the jazz stravaganza, but you know what happened. I felt tired and left early. I thought I could just go back and get it the morning after. And that being said, I'm pretty sure the Masked Stranger suit didn't just magically manifest itself into my bag. But it certainly wasn't there when I left the dressing room. So the only time someone could have stashed a suit there was after the rehearsal began. Indeed. Unfortunately, the only two people we know to have entered the dressing room, Mr. Rockwell and Miss Garnet herself, couldn't have done it. How so? Assuming the suit is the same one that the masked stranger was wearing on the night of the murder, it could only have been put there after midnight, after the crime had taken place. Oh, right! The voice from the stranger's mask was recorded on the tournament room tape, so the mask had to be upstairs at the time of the crime. Yes, and both Ms. Garnet and Mr. Rockwell have an alibi for that time. Lucky was performing on stage and Mr. Rockwell was stuck inside the VIP elevator. Any ideas on how to proceed on that front, Mr. Wright? I suppose you could always try looking for someone lugging around a year's worth of grape juice. <laughs> Daddy, you should really act more responsibly. What will people think hearing the bottles clinking together in the bag? It's bad PR for the Anything Agency. Nothing. Mainly because there isn't any clinking to be heard. I bought the drinks in bulk, so everything was properly padded and made no sound. Still weighed a ton, though. Mr. Wright sure loves his grape juice. So, where in the dressing room did you leave your bag exactly? I set it down right next to her duffel bags. Wait, bags? As in, more than one? Uh-huh. After all, she took two bags from the cocktail party. Her own and the one reserved for the masked stranger. I don't suppose you mind if I take two bags, then? A girl can never have too much space to carry her belongings in. Knock yourself out. House wants to see these things gone either way. Don't mind if I do. Now that you mention it, I remember it too. Either way. I wouldn't be too worried. I'm fairly confident that Clavier isn't actually going to claim I'm the big bad mastermind behind all of this. That kind of assertion has way too many holes in it. Then what is he up to? Between this and the offer he made earlier? Who knows? All I could say is that he's got to have a good reason for it. So what do you think of the case at the moment, Daddy? As the judge said, Finding out how the masked stranger vanished from the tournament floor will either make or break this case. But if the VIP elevator was stuck at midnight and the fire escape was unusable, then there'd be no way for anyone to leave the tournament floor! And yet the stranger somehow did. A curious mystery for sure. Hopefully the blueprints of the royal flush I managed to acquire can give you a clue. I had them delivered to the casino for your convenience. Turns out the place has gone over some extensive renovations in the past. And old buildings tend to house secrets. It's at least worth a shot carefully checking out the crime scene. It's not like we've had a proper chance to yet. And then you should definitely go do that. Anything else? Oh, the case file! That's right. You were about to point something out in the AC3 case file during the recess? <laughs> that I was. Here's the file. Have a look and see if you can't find what I mean. Incident number AC3. Status closed. Defendant, Charles Argyne. Crime, aggravated gambling fraud. Outcome, defendant sentenced to 10 years in prison. Found guilty in absentia. Declared a fugitive at time of sentencing. Trial data. Trial dates, January 15th and 16th, 2018. Prosecutor, Artemis Morrigan. Defense attorney, Richard Gunner. Witnesses, Detective Jean Eric, Hector Nash. Withdrawn by the defense. K-1. 
case summary. An anonymous tip was made to the police after the Argyne Gambling Showcase Poker Tournament held on the 31st of December, 2017. The caller claimed the electronic poker tables used in the tournament, manufactured by the defendant's company, were in violation of the Japanifornia Gambling Act as they were programmed to give an unfair advantage to the defendant, Argyne Systems CEO Charles Argyne, who had won the tournament. Forensic testing confirmed this claim, and the defendant was subsequently charged with aggravated gambling fraud and arrested, although he was later released on bail. Mr. Argyne maintained his innocence throughout the trial, but his attorney could not provide any evidence to counter the forensics findings. The defendant was found guilty and sentenced to 10 years in prison. The court also ordered the full seizure of all Argyne Systems assets and the recall of all gambling devices manufactured by the company pending further investigation. Having been absent from the final day of his trial, the authorities moved to arrest Argyne and his residence. However, they found that Argyne had fled, leaving behind a 13-year-old dependent. The dependent had no living family members, so a foster home was found for her by the state. Despite extensive pursuit of the defendant, Argyne remains a fugitive at the time of this report. Did you spot someone familiar in that document? Hector Nash. Looks like our math man knows a lot more than he lets on. The question is, what did that old curmudgeon have to say all those years ago? And what's this part about him being withdrawn by the defense? It would seem that Mr. Nash was initially prepared as a witness for the defense, but for some reason the defense attorney ultimately decided against letting him testify. But why? And that's something you'd have to ask Mr. Nash about. Couldn't we just ask the defense attorney directly? Uh, Mr. Gunner, was it? A good idea in theory, Apollo. Unfortunately, I think you'll find he won't be of any help to you, seeing as he's been deceased for nearly a decade or so. Traffic accident, you see. It was all over the news back then. He was quite the notorious figure among defense attorneys, after all. I'm not the least bit surprised that Gunner would have had a hand in a case like this. Uh, huh? How come I've never heard of him? I don't blame you for not knowing, Apollo. It all happened way before your time, and they don't exactly teach you this at law school. At least, I sincerely hope they don't. Now I'm curious. What can you tell me about Gunner? He might have been the most high-profile defense attorney in the country at the time, only taking equally high-profile cases and coming out on top. His claim to fame was acquitting the son of the Ravales family Don in a trial that was meant to be the death knell for their entire organization. Suffice to say, the Ravales were in his debt. After that, it was rumored that Gunner could make any problem for his clients disappear as long as they were willing to shell out the cash for his extraordinary rates. And I do mean this literally. It seemed that in his following trials, key witnesses would refuse to testify against Gunner's clients, or vanish altogether. Incriminating evidence also seemed to go missing at opportune moments. And nobody looked into this? There were attempts. For example, a certain investigative journalist said he was working on an expose on Gunner, Days later, the journalist's body was found floating in the Angel River. You can probably connect the dots. Make no mistake, Gunner became a very dangerous man to cross, and everyone facing him knew that. It sounds like this guy could have started the Dark Age of the Law by himself. Not quite. Back in the day, Gunner was very much seen as an outlier. A morally bankrupt rogue lawyer with all the right connections and resources to make any problems go away. And he did receive his comeuppance eventually. It wasn't until later that public opinion shifted to all attorneys and prosecutors being corrupt, seeking to win by any means available to them. So Gunner was the guy to make problems disappear, but didn't he lose this case? He did, strangely enough. But it appears that he wasn't too bothered about it. I'm sure he had been paid handsomely either way. Incidentally, it also ended up being the last case of his career before his... accident. In the end, maybe it's a good thing he never got to see what our justice system has become. <sighs> what a terrible person! It all sounds pretty hard to believe. Yet that's what happened. And it was a mere prelude to the way things are now. 
Getting back to the AC3 case, there's something else I noticed in the file. Yeah? It reads here that the defendant also left a 13-year-old dependent. Indeed, he did. <sighs> I wonder what became of her. Did you look into it, Mr. Wright? I could find nothing more, unfortunately. Information about wards of state is highly confidential. Anyway, that's about all I have for you on the AC3 case. Thanks, Daddy. You can really get some work done when you're not snoozing on the couch. <clears throat> I'm sorry to interrupt, but Mr. Wright is wanted for questioning. Looks like our time is up. Uh, all right. Is there anything else we should know before we go? Just remember to ask for the blueprints at the casino lobby. Other than that, I trust this investigation in your capable hands. Oh, and I suggest you find some evidence to prove I wasn't up to any shady business that night. The free room and board is nice, but I prefer sleeping in my own bed. <clears throat> I'll be going now. See you two later, I hope. Take care, Daddy! We'll get you out of here in no time, Mr. Wright! Oh, I have no doubt that you will. Guess that means Jack's interrogation is finished. Must be. Can we see Mr. Porter next? Certainly. I'll go fetch him for you. Howdy! So kind of you to send Nikki here to keep me company. The interrogators it didn't really warm up to my idea of talking it over a game of cards, <laughs> see? It wasn't really our intention, but you're welcome. So, how can I help y'all out? We were hoping you could help answer some questions again. I'll try my very best. What do y'all have for me? Being the security chief, you wouldn't happen to know if there are any hidden ways someone could use to leave the tournament floor? Yeah, we're trying to figure out how the masked stranger escaped. As far as I'm aware, the only ways to leave are the VIP elevator and the fire escape. For as long as I've been the security chief, I've not been told of any other exits. Although, the casino had just finished going through renovations some years earlier. What exactly were they renovating? The entire place, really, as they had to make the casino abide by the tenets of the Gambling Act. Soundproofing and such. I guess it wouldn't hurt to take a look to see what you can find. I suppose the blueprints will come in handy today. Still, neither of those options explain the stranger's disappearance. I reckon one could have jumped off the balcony, but then we'd have two corpses to deal with. And I would have seen anyone coming to the balcony anyway. How about a hiding place then? Taking a look at the map, we've been everywhere in the tournament floor so far except for one place, Mr. House's office. Well, if you want to go check it out, be my guest. My keycard should give you access. Not sure what you're expecting to find in there, though. Pretty sure there's no panic room for the stranger to sit in while downing cocktails. Just a big safe for House's personal stuff. Maybe not, but we can try figuring out what House was up to with the blackmail note, the fake mask stranger suit and all. I agree. If we can put together what his plan was, it might help us crack this case. Hmm. Speaking of cracking, there's another thing you might want to know. The code to Mr. House's safe is probably 000 0001. Number one, huh? <laughs> yeah, he must have thought he was pretty clever. Since the code is seven digits, I just checked the prints on the keypad and the rest is basic psychology. And here I was about to start calling you Safecracker Jack. Well, security is my thing, so I would know a thing or two about breaching it too. Too bad. I was kind of hoping this would be my chance to call in some favors and assemble a ragtag team of magicians for a high stakes heist. What kind of connections have you been making behind my back? Just some friends and colleagues. I'll have you know, professional magicians are experts at making items of any size and value disappear, as well as escaping seemingly impossible situations. Which reminds me, once we find the stranger, I should ask them for some pointers on disappearing. I guess we're lucky we have an inside man at the casino, so we don't have to resort to anything unorthodox. <sighs> Seriously. I pray I'll never have to defend Trucy's dozen in court. So why do you think we should check the safe? Well, truth be told, 
the safe might contain what we need for the federal investigation. But I'm not asking you just because of that. House had all of his secrets in that safe. And if it's worth attempting to send me to an early grave to protect them, I'd wager they must be relevant to our case somehow. Just don't grab any upfront payments from there, all right? Hey, we're not that desperate to pay the bills. Besides, Daddy's going to win us the $100 million later. Unless he sent to the slammer with me, that is. Like we'll ever let that happen. All the more reason for you to check that safe out then. So how come you never took a look at the possible evidence yourself? You knew the code after all. I couldn't. That safe has a security system that pages house every time the safe is open. Considering I'm the only other person with access to his office, if House got wind that someone was opening his safe behind his back, the entire jig would be up. But now that he's, well, you know. I don't think he'll mind if we take a peek, right? I suppose there's no harm in checking it out. And should you happen to stumble upon any connections to organized crime, you'll let me know, won't you? Of course. Great. One more thing, Jack. Do let Daddy know about, you know. Got it. I'll pull him aside for a proper chat as soon as I can. I guess the next step would be to head back to the Royal Flush. We need to prove Daddy's innocence. Ahem. And yours too, of course. Right. We should check the backstage area when we can. I'd also like to have a chat with a certain statistician when the opportunity presents itself. Bye then, Jack. Good luck. I'll be here if you need me. Seeing as I ain't going anywhere else. This place is as busy as ever, it seems. We should get busy too. Let's ask for the blueprints before we forget. Uh, excuse me, Mr... Ah, welcome back, Miss Wright and Mr. Justice. I've been waiting eagerly for your return. Uh, well, here we are. May I say, your performance in today's trial was quite exhilarating. I could hardly contain my excitement. Oh? You must be really invested in this case, but I don't recall seeing you at the gallery. Heavens no. I could never abandon my shift for leisure activities. No, I watched the stream live on my cell phone. Among the other 100,000 or so people. Wait. The trial is being broadcast live? Whoa, we've got quite the audience, Apollo. I should sneak in a magic trick or two to keep things interesting. Why are you not the least bit phased by this? Oh, you didn't know. No wonder you didn't seem to be concerned about your performance at all. Uh, I am now? What's going on here? It's certainly a novel concept. I wouldn't know why they'd do so but the entertainment and informational value of it all is tremendous. Maybe you should ask someone from the High Prosecutor's Office, as they are the ones hosting the stream. The High Prosecutor's Office? Is this Claudier's doing? Just imagine, someone could be watching us crack the case right now. As if, but I think I would have noticed someone following us by now. Besides, the mere thought of complete strangers watching our every move gives me the heebie-jeebies. No time to be camera shy, Apollo. Who knew you'd end up upstaging me in showbiz? It's not like I intended or wanted to! Don't say that. Being famous has its perks. Quite so. I am fully 100% behind Team Justice, sir. So if there's anything you need my help with, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, so before we forget, any mail for Mr. Wright? Oh, yes. This file was delivered earlier today. Here you go. These are the blueprints Mr. Wright spoke of, all right? You see anything? I should probably compare it to the floor plan we had on our room's door. Still, it's quite difficult to tell for now. Being on location would be a big help. Okay, suppose we'll take a closer look at it later. Thanks for the help, Mr. Bellboy. You are most welcome, miss. If there's anything else you should need, Please don't hesitate to ask. Well, in that case, would you inform Mr. Hector Nash that we'd like to see him later? I'm sorry, sir. I would love to. 
but Mr. Nash has specifically asked not to be disturbed today, as he's busy with his work. Okay, can you tell us where he is so we know not to disturb him? Just steer clear of room 314. Got it, thanks. No problem at all. We pride ourselves on our rock-solid service. Of course, by helping you, I too will become famous. They'll call me the bellboy who helped the defense find a key witness. Well, at least his delusions of grandeur are helpful to us. Speaking of witnesses, you wouldn't happen to know what became of Mr. Rockwell? I believe that the police took him down to the precinct for further questioning after his confession. Looks like we won't be talking to Rockwell today. Not that we really need to. Today's trial more or less cleared him off the list of suspects. Right. So, should we head backstage next, Apollo? I would advise against that, miss. It would seem that in the aftermath of Mr. Rockwell's confession, the police have taken a keen interest in the area. The investigation is currently in full swing, and they've asked that the area be kept clear for the time being. I suppose we can head there later. If we're lucky, Emma will have discovered a clue or two by then. So in that case, up we go? That's right. We can chat with Mr. Nash after we've checked the scene. Thanks for your help, Mr. Bellboy. Don't mention it, sir. Have a lovely day. You can rest easy knowing that Forehead Fan 33 and the rest of the Forehead Force will be cheering you on all the way. Yeah, where would we be without that kind of support? All right, we're here. We may want to check the crime scene first. Ah, uh, look! There's Detective Sky. Huh? Oh, it's you again. Nice going in court today. If we're not counting the fact that our good prosecutor managed to put Mr. Wright behind bars. That's just a temporary setback. I take it you were following the stream as well? I was. Scientific Snacku will root for anyone willing to take Prosecutor Gavin down a peg or two. Kinda poetic, really. The streaming of the trial was his idea, but I bet he's regretting it after you've humiliated him in front of such a large audience. I beg to differ on who's doing the humiliating, but as long as that's your takeaway. And you couldn't tell us about this yesterday? I would have if I had known at the time. Gavin had apparently briefed the investigation team about this by email. Thing is, anything with his name on it doesn't get past my junk mail filter. Good thing I caught a couple of my colleagues watching the stream of today's trial on their phones, though. So it was Clavier's idea after all. But what is he hoping to gain from this? Beats me. The retired rock star probably got tired of having no audience and needed a boost for his ego. Still, accusing Mr. Wright goes too far. Even for him. Don't worry, detective. We'll be sure to get Daddy out in no time. That's the spirit. Otherwise, I may have to direct my snacku-fueled ire towards you. Ow! Consider that a sample of what awaits you should you fail. How does she make those damn snacks hit so hard? Now that we're all on the same page, what can I do for you? We'd like to check out the crime scene, if possible. Likewise. Luckily, the FBI seems to be packing up, so come back in a moment, all right? Sure, we'll investigate somewhere else for now. Say, I thought you would have been backstage with the rest of the investigators. Oh, someone told you about that? Yes, our team spread pretty thin as it is. As you can see, someone has to keep an eye on the crime scene proper. As soon as the feds get out, we'll get to work. Naturally, I volunteered to be the one. Less chance of running into Gavin that way. That would explain it. Anyway, not a whole lot to tell you right now. What about Daddy's duffel bag? I'm as shocked as you are, but Mr. Wright has admitted to leaving his duffel bag backstage. And that's where we found the suit. So you searched the dressing room? That's right. Once Prosecutor Popstar heard that the backstage was a relevant location that night, we focused our efforts there. Not a whole lot left to investigate here in the tournament floor, seeing as the feds are still hogging the crime scene. You wouldn't mind if we took a look inside Mr. House's office then? Knock yourself out. We already gave it a once-over, found the wiretap receiver, and nothing else of interest. Okay, we'll be back soon. You know where to find me when you're done.
Well, the office is certainly gaudy. Seems pretty fitting to Mr. House's persona. Let's take a look around. Who knows what we'll find? This is a bunk bed? Why would he have one in his office? I suppose the royal flush really was the only thing he had left. That's pretty sad. Mr. House did not even have a house to call his own anymore. Apart from this house of cards, that is. Is this the device House used to eavesdrop on the phone lines? Seems to be the one. He was probably desperate to figure out the stranger's identity. Looks like it only recorded Mr. Rockwell's phone call that night and nothing else. Kinda creepy, not gonna lie. Well, there's the safe Jack mentioned. And we've got the code. Let's do this. Open sesame! <laughs> Looks like that did the trick. Now let's see what treasure this thing holds. Well, Apollo, did we hit the jackpot? Hard to say. Looks like we've got a journal, a couple of letters, and some sort of weird device. No idea what it is, though. Wow. Not a single penny in sight. I guess Jack wasn't kidding about Mr. House going broke. You'd never be able to tell from the way he acted. Anyway, there's also some kind of list in here. Let me see! Well then, considering what we know so far, this appears to be some sort of list of dirt on the participants of the All-Stars Legends Tournament. Wow, House didn't even bother to get blackmail on Daddy. He's anything but irrelevant. He may have just counted on Mr. Wright getting knocked out in the first round, but still, harsh. Looks like House never managed to find anything on the masked stranger. Plenty on the rest, though. Take a look at Mr. Nash. Argyne Systems. The very same name was in the AC3 file. So, what's in the journal? Looks to be full of technical jargon and details. Can't make heads or tails out of it. The strange thing is that the last entry was written down in 2017. Almost a decade ago. How about the owner? Can't say. Whoever this belongs to didn't bother writing down their name. I think it's a safe bet to assume that House didn't write this himself, though. True enough, but that just begs the question of why he had someone else's journal locked away in his safe. Is there anything at all in there that might help us? Hmm. The final pages appear to be written in a more simplistic manner. Problem. The new tables have a critical bug. Additional factor. Design prevents remote large-scale modification of faulty code. Only temporary short-range modification possible. Additional factor. Discretion. Cannot let Charles know. Solution. It's just a bunch of question marks and sentences scrawled over again and again with pen in what looks to be increasing frustration. So whoever wrote that never found the solution to their conundrum, huh? What about the letters? Let's see. This first one is from the Gatewater Corporation's legal department. Dear Mr. House, while your concerns about security are valid, our lawyers have consulted the gambling board and concluded that using physical cards instead of the electronic poker table in the tournament does not violate the Japanifornia Gambling Act. The All-Stars Legends Tournament may default back to using the electronic table as per your request, only in the case that the masked stranger is unable to participate. However, I remind you that as per our contract, our sponsorship offer for the grand prize is only valid if the masked stranger attends the tournament, unless their absence is due to disqualification for failing to comply with the tournament's rules. Looks like Mr. House had some serious issues with the masked stranger's request to play using regular cards. Hmm. There must have been a reason for all this. What about the other letters? Looks like they're all from the Tender Lender Loan Company. My dear Rex House, you haven't forgotten your promise, have you? The serfdom to your queen must continue until the king's ransom has been paid in full. Rule your domain is decreed, but beware, for a usurped monarch will soon meet the guillotine. Your beloved Viola. 
Sounds sketchy, considering it's from a collection agency. I think Daddy mentioned them once when I asked about some of his past cases. Anything I should be aware of? They're not the type of people you want to be indebted to. Let me guess. Organized crime? Yep. Apparently the place is run by the Caterverini crime family. Sound familiar yet? The same people Jack was investigating. I believe it's safe to assume that this letter is not a simple lover's quarrel if you catch my drift. I don't believe this one will help Jack's investigation, unfortunately. He already knows House was in debt. Here's another one from last May. My darling Rex, it has been so very long since your last gift to me. Such a predicament. Your treasury is filled with riches, which you cannot touch. But perhaps the king can yet be saved from the gallows, for his treasury may hold much more than gold. Your beloved Viola. His treasury may hold much more than gold? What could that mean? Not sure. Maybe Jack would have an idea? We should definitely ask him about it later. There's one more! This looks to be the latest one. From November. My dear Noah, the whispers speak that a usurper now threatens your throne. I fear they may succeed, lest you first partake in intrigue. Past midnight hour, post New Year's Eve, have them be seen committing a violent deed. Inside the great tourney's hall, a false mask on you shall make the stranger fall. Sounds more than a little suspicious. If we ignore the purple pros, these are direct instructions to Mr. House on how to deal with the masked stranger. The orders came from the Mafia? Looks that way. But this letter is the odd one out. All the others are addressed to Rex, but this one says Noah. Not sure about whether that's significant or not. But regardless, looks like Mr. House ended up following the instructions to a T. So is that all? Not quite. There's still this device. I've never seen anything like this before. Neither have I, but I suppose we should borrow it all the same. It was important enough to be kept inside the safe after all. Guess that's everything we need from the safe. I don't think we'll find anything else of use in here. I suppose we should head back to Detective Sky next and see if the federal agents have left the crime scene yet. Sounds like a plan. Ah, you're back, and just in time. The FBI's boys are finally gone, so feel free to check out the scene with me. I'm not sure what else you're hoping to find, though. It's been pretty well combed through by now. Do you know if their investigation revealed anything new? If it did, they weren't sharing it with us. They did seem somewhat dissatisfied upon leaving, so I can hazard a guess it didn't. I see. Thanks anyway. Oh, by the way, Emma, how come you didn't find any of Mr. Rockwell's things in what we thought was the stranger's room? It would have been so much easier to figure out who was staying there and it just seemed out of place that you'd miss that sort of thing. According to Mr. Rockwell, his luggage got lost on the way. He didn't take a duffel bag from the cocktail party either. Simply put, Nothing pointed to him staying in the room. Quite the ascetic, that man. Now, did you want to see the scene or keep criticizing our investigation? Uh, the former, please. The stage is yours. And if you should manage to conjure up some extra evidence again, that'd be much appreciated. After you, detective. Here we are. The scene is as pristine as it gets. Not taking into account the dozens of people who have worked it over for the past days. I'll be over here. Samples to collect and important forensics to get underway. You know? She says while munching on snack coos. This isn't one of Trucy's magic shows! Okay, Polly. Keep your eyes peeled for anything suspicious. Wow. It's hard to imagine that the charred pile over there used to be worth a hundred million dollars. It reminds me of the time one of Daddy's friends came over to cook his famous samurai dogs for dinner. One thing led to another, and we ended up having takeaway burgers while waiting for all the smoke to clear. 
Well, this was probably the most expensive serving of fried rabbit in history. The floor is still riddled with these small beads. I wonder where they came from. I couldn't say. But I'd hate to be the one who has to clean them up. I bet they'll be finding them for years to come. Yeah, it's like glitter, only soft and squishy. Scientific analysis has determined that they are polystyrene beads, commonly found inside beanbag chairs and stuffed animals. So, essentially, this is... Mr. Pinky's blood! Exactly. Blood type, P.S. Not quite how I would have put it, but fair enough. So this is from one of the Pinky Rabbit plushies? Most of the Pinky toys are filled with other stuff, actually. Except for one. Don't tell me. Our little fire starter? That's right. Mr. Pinky was found missing an arm. So that probably explains how this stuff got all over the place. It really wasn't a great day for Mr. Pinky, huh? He's in worse shape than he was in the beginning of that trailer. Don't remind me. As far as I'm concerned, there is no Pinky Rabbit movie. Not even the police wanted these bags, huh? They really are an eyesore, aren't they? Hard to imagine Lucky took two of these with her. I suppose she cares more about function than form. Although I'd say the design barely delivers even on that. Nothing to be seen inside either of these. Guess that also makes them useless as evidence. The masked stranger is really starting to run out of possible hiding spots. I said these bags would even fit a child, let alone a grown adult inside. Looks like the table made it in one piece, despite the fire and the sprinklers. Although, they were gonna play with physical cards, whether or not it survived would have made little difference regarding the tournament. Looks like whoever made it paid special attention to waterproofing the surface. Of course, the actual hardware is safely locked away under the base of the table. I assume, at least. We weren't exactly given a key, but check this out. How about a round of cards, you two? No thanks. We need to focus on proving Mr. Porter's innocence. Trucy's right. We don't have time to lose. Hmm, suit yourselves. Hmm. I wonder if this thing has solitaire. This is where I found Mr. Porter. Yeah. I remember it too. I suppose we're lucky that Jack ended up against the mixing table. That recording really ended up saving us in court. Not sure I'd call it lucky, but we have to use what we get. What's this on the floor? A remote? Go ahead and press the button to follow! You know you want to! Guess I will. Of a rabbit who will stop at nothing. <laughs> Until it meets his mission. Turn it off, so Polly! Phew! Thank goodness for mute! Holy haploids in a handbasket! What do you think you're doing? You almost gave me a heart attack! Sorry, Emma. I didn't know this thing controlled the projector. What was that? The trailer for the new Pinky Rabbit movie. It should be on the screen right over... Wait, what happened to the screen? Looks like it's burned away. It was hanging right above the burning cache. No surprise there. Albeit now, I'm curious about just what I missed out on. Trust me, you got lucky not having to witness that mess. Well, that's about it, I'd say. We've looked pretty much everywhere for the time being. Not quite yet. Now it's time to unleash our secret weapon. You've got another trick up your sleeve to undermine Gavin? Oh, this I've gotta see. Something like that. Polly, if you would do the honors. All right, let's have a look. You see anything? According to these blueprints, there should be something right behind this very wall. No door to be seen, though. Take it from a magician, Polly. Things are very often not as they seem to the naked eye. Time to start knocking! <laughs> Just what exactly are you two doing? Brace yourself, Emma! I'm about to make the prosecution's case disappear! If you could extend that to the prosecutor himself, <laughs> that'd be great. Polly! Help me out here. Try pulling this panel. All right, then. <laughs> Phew. 
It's just too tight! Come on! Put your back into it, Polly! Jeez! I'm telling you, this thing won't budge! You used the same excuse with the pickle jar that one time. You just need a better grip and... Uh, hey, what do you know? There's a tiny latch in here! I almost strained my back and now you tell me there's a latch?! Just open it, you silly goose! Time to see what's behind door number one! Ta-da! A victory of the brain over brawn! What the? Do you two have some sort of magic powers to make evidence appear out of thin air? Among other things. Say, I wouldn't mind you teaching me your tricks. Sorry, a magician never reveals their secrets. Hmph. It was worth a shot. Okay, that's one hidden ladder discovered. Yep. Although, couldn't it technically be a stepladder? That's probably the furthest thing from a stepladder! It's just rungs on a wall! But you have to admit, you still have to take steps on it. Well, whatever you want to call it. I wonder where it leads. I guess the only way to find out is to go down ourselves. Don't even think about it, you two. Nobody's going down that ladder. We need to preserve the scene. Come on! You want to know where it leads as much as we do. Maybe so, but leaving your prints on it is the quickest way for Prosecutor Gavin to get on your case about compromising evidence. Emma's right. We should let the police examine this officially. Oh, I wanted to see you climb down the spooky dark hatch. I'm sure you did. Sorry to crush your dreams. Can't you at least check the blueprints and see where this leads to? Ugh, the curiosity is killing me! Beats me. The blueprints we have only show the tournament floor. Bummer. Well, guess this find means my break's over. Thanks for the help, you two. Break? Whatever happened to important forensics? You can thank Daddy later. He's the one who got us these blueprints. Is that so? <laughs> guess I owe Mr. Wright another favor. In fact, tell you what. As far as I'm concerned, you were never here. That way, I get to rub this find in Gavin's smug face. And you don't have to worry about not having followed proper procedure. It's a win-win situation, really. Sure, let's do that. Sounds good to me. I guess I'll report this in and see if the investigators backstage can spare some manpower to examine this. It's going to take a while to get their gear moved over here, though. Yes! If they're focusing on this room, we'll probably be able to investigate backstage soon! Thanks a lot, you two. Oh, and when you see Mr. Wright, tell him I send my regards. Where to next, Polly? Well, the police are probably going to take a while to move from the backstage. In the meantime, I am curious about Mr. Nash's involvement in the AC3 case. We ought to stop by his room while we wait for the investigators to clear. Okay, let's go see the math man. Here we are. Okay, what's our battle plan, Apollo? What do you mean? You haven't forgotten, right? Mr. Nash hates our guts. How are we going to convince him to speak to us? We may not see eye to eye, but as long as he's a man of his word, he'll have no choice but to tell us what he knows. Remember, he was very specific on what he would be willing to talk about. We've got to give it a shot at least. Leave me alone. I said go away! <sighs> Unbelievable. Soon after I specifically requested not to be disturbed. What do you want? Oh, it's you two. Uh, Mr. Nash, wait! That's Dr. Nash to you, thank you very much. Get lost, I have nothing more to say to you. Please? really need to ask you some questions. In that case, you know my price. Will you pay by cash or check? Neither. I believe you said I could freely ask you about anything related to engineering and statistics, but not the case. I may have uttered something along those lines. Never expected you to come bother me because of it. I guess that serves me right, huh? 
leaving a loophole for an attorney like you to abuse at will. So, what do you want? I've got better things to do than talk to you. Namely, I need to figure out what caused the bug in my counting device. That's actually one of the topics I had in mind. How exactly does your device function? I'll spare you the technical details, because someone like you wouldn't know how to appreciate them. Essentially, it registered every gunpowder explosion that took place that night in a dome-shaped area surrounding the hotel from the tournament floor and above. So Hector's device was recording the fireworks show. I should probably make a mental note of this. Honestly, what are the chances? An anomaly like that ruining my chance at victory for two years in a row. Oh? What happened last year? Really? If you must know, they had to cancel the whole thing because some idiot didn't take proper precautions. A bad trajectory plus unfavorable wind conditions equals a raging fire, which led to the evacuation of the entire casino. At least this year they had the good sense to wait until all the rockets had been fired before they sent everyone running. That's because they turned the fire alarms off for the duration of the fireworks spectacular. Good on them. Having my data jeopardized two years in a row would have been the last straw. Is he completely ignoring the fact that the entire building could have burned down? Are we done now? Afraid not, Dr. Nash. We'd still like to hear your opinion on another device. Figures. <laughs> Hurry up and show it to me so I can get rid of you too. Here it is. <gasps> Where? Where did you find this? I demand an answer. Whoa, wasn't expecting that. What got into him? It was in Mr. House's safe. His safe? That rat bastard house. I knew it must have been him all this time. That means you must have the journal as well. Hand it over. Wait, how do you know about the journal? Because it's mine. I lost both of those items a long time ago. But since you attorneys need your proof, I wrote the last entry in it back in 2017. Y you won't find my name anywhere in there. It would have been redundant for me to write it down in my personal journal. No way is he pulling that from thin air. This must be his then. Dr. Nash, just what have we discovered? You promised to answer our questions. I'm making an exception. This doesn't concern you. Now hand them over. We can't just give you the evidence we found. Found? You just said you broke into houses safe. Do they teach lawyers to lockpick nowadays as well? Honestly, at this point, how can we tell you apart from petty criminals? Technically, we had the permission of law enforcement, but I doubt he cares. I hope you weren't thinking of using these in that trial of yours. Why shouldn't we? They could prove crucial to us. There's absolutely zero chance of that happening. You have no idea what you've got in your hands. And even if you did, you're about a decade late for them to do you any good. The only reason we don't know is because you refuse to tell us, Dr. Nash. That's because I don't trust scumbag lawyers like you. I've learned from my past mistakes. Past mistakes, huh? I wonder if it has to do with a certain notorious defense attorney. Dr. Nash, I've been curious about one thing. Why do you hate attorneys so much? You're seriously asking me that? Doesn't everyone hate attorneys in this day and age? Okay, let me rephrase my question. Does it have anything to do with a certain Richard Gunner? Gunner? What would you even know about Gunner? Seems like that got his attention. Time to press the issue. To be honest, not a whole lot. We know they were acting as the defense for Charles Argyne in the infamous AC3 case. And we also know you were supposed to be a witness in that trial. We were hoping you could tell us more. You've really been looking into all this, huh? Fine. If you want to hear it so badly, I'll tell you all about how Gunner stabbed us in the back and how he was rewarded with riches. For nearly 10 years, I've harbored this bitterness, all because of that deceitful, greedy lawyer. What happened, Dr. Nash? <sighs> it's 
It's a long story, one I'm not willing to talk about in this hallway. So if you want to hear the rest, come on in. Listen well. Maybe even you will come to realize why lawyers are the scum of the earth. It feels like a lifetime ago, back when I was a different man. I was the chief engineer of Argyne Systems. The company was famous for our various products in electrical and software engineering. Most notably, we designed many gambling devices. It wasn't considered the most honorable thing back then, although our machines were considered the best in the market. And this was all thanks to the company's founder, Charles Argyne. Charles was a brilliant inventor and a peerless poker player who had built the company from nothing. And not only that, he was also the founder and leader of The Deck, famed for his personal integrity. When the news broke out about gambling devices being used in money laundering, he personally set out to change things for the better, to ensure that an end would be put to this kind of crime. I had the honor of being asked to be his partner in this grand task. In the end, our solution to this problem was Project Ace. What? Don't interrupt me. This isn't one of your cross-examinations. Now, where was I? Charles and I created Project Ace, or the Anti-Cheat Engine a miracle of software and technology that aimed to eradicate all foul play associated with tempered gambling devices. The two of us worked on the project in utmost secrecy with security as our first concern. We even split the project in half between the two of us in order to ensure that neither one of us knew the full details. And eventually, we had created the ultimate, untamperable video poker table. Nothing on the market today still compares to it. It was truly revolutionary. It was beautiful. It was perfect. Or so we thought. What happened? Charles wanted to show our creation in the wake of the Japanifornia Gambling Act being passed, and so the Argyne Gambling Showcase Tournament was planned for New Year's Eve of 2017. At first, it was a huge success. People were blown away by what we had built. Even if some found it suspicious that Charles himself ended up winning the tournament. I mean, <laughs> of course, the tournament was open to everyone and Charles was a poker grandmaster. So the result was well within the margins of probability to me. It wasn't until someone decided to get the police and the gambling board involved that things got out of hand. And that's what led to the AC3 case? Yes. This anonymous informant had claimed that the tables were blatantly rigged in favor of Charles. And that's also what the investigation concluded. Couldn't it have been a coincidence? Poker is essentially a game of chance, after all. No. The forensics team simulated thousands of hands and the bias was clear without any doubt. It was no mistake, and thus Charles was arrested on the spot. But the worst was yet to come. Enter the scavengers. Scavengers? Yellow journalists and other opportunistic parasites smelled blood in the water. After the charges against Charles were made public, they went into a frenzy. What delicious irony it was for them that a fierce proponent of fairer gambling was exposed as a fraudster. And they truly went all in with it. I saw headlines by the dozen decrying him as a criminal and a cheater. Charles Argyne would never have cheated. It went against everything he stood for. He despised cheaters. But nay, Nobody cared what the truth was. All they knew about him was that he was the criminal from the headlines. And those headlines just kept on and on, coming as an endless bombardment. 
to the point that it felt as though the entire nation was calling for his head on a plate. Charles Argyne was found guilty long before he ever set foot in a courtroom, and no defense attorney would step up to take a hopeless case such as this. That is, no one except Richard Gunner, a vulture in the guise of a man preying on the desperate. Was there no other choice for him? I'm sure Daddy would have taken his case. He was practicing at that time. <laughs> As if some two-bit attorney would have been any better than a public defender. Charles would have been legally eviscerated, so he had to take the gamble with Gunner. And in exchange for his services, that viper demanded an outrageous sum of money. Charles had no choice but to pay up. It was blackmail in all but name. And despite all that, I was forced to witness firsthand how my friend's reputation and life's work was destroyed by opportunistic scum and hypocrites while Gunner simply let it happen. That sounds horrible. It truly does. It looks like Dr. Nash is finally opening up. I never should have trusted him to handle it. I should have... I should have spoken up. What do you mean? It was all my fault. What exactly was your fault, Dr. Nash? I... I know what caused the anomaly in the table's office. See, the core of the ACE project was a device we called the Master Key. The very same device in your hands right now. We designed it to be the only thing in the world capable of adjusting the programming in the tables. And it was only ever supposed to be able to access each table once to upload the code held within. It was supposed to? Yes. Once we finished our prototypes, Charles was overjoyed. The Japanifornia Gambling Act had just passed and everyone was scrambling to make their machines compliant. It was a golden opportunity for us to corner the market, so I urged Charles to go straight to the production phase. But, in my rush to finish my half of the project, I had dropped the ball at the last possible moment. I had forgotten to remove some critical code that allowed us to bypass the encryption and debug the tables with the master key at will. In other words, if anyone were to find this exploit, they could use it to change the odds with impunity at any time to favor whoever they wanted. And I discovered this only after we had produced thousands of these tables. And due to our security measures, we couldn't have just modified the uploaded code anymore. There's nothing you could have done at all? I tried my hardest to come up with a solution, but, as I said, we designed these tables from the ground up for integrity. Although we left the user interface open to customization, anything related to Oz was interconnected in a way that would have bricked the table if modifications were ever attempted. How did you find out about the exploit then? Charles entrusted the master key to me for safekeeping once initial production was finished. The long hours and lack of sleep had surely taken their toll, so I decided to go through my code one last time with fresh eyes, just in case. Needless to say, I was mortified when I discovered the vulnerability. But didn't you just say that you need the master key to adjust the programming? Surely that alone makes the table secure enough? In a project based entirely on security, an exploit like this is beyond unacceptable. There is incredible incentive for people to find any flaws in security and reverse engineer them for their own benefit. Sooner or later, a dedicated enough team could have created a tool to access the programming. Now imagine this happening 10 years down the line, with our technology being the standard everywhere. It would have allowed the unprecedented ability to cheat, and would have destroyed the company if it ever came to light. So, because of my oversight, 
Millions of company funds had been spent creating tables that had a glaring vulnerability that couldn't be fixed. Not to mention that the massive recalls would have ruined our reputation and cost us even more. I couldn't tell Charles that I had screwed up that bad. The company was everything to me. I was happy working there. But what did you end up doing in the end? I was damned, no matter what I did. I thought that writing down my thoughts might help me solve the dilemma. But after painstakingly trying to analyze my options, I only ended up furthering my anxiety about the matter. I needed to calm my nerves, so I grabbed my journal as well as the master key and did the unthinkable. I tried to drown my sorrows. You went to a bar? It's not like I had a bottle of whiskey hidden inside my work desk. That's not the part I was criticizing! Why would you take something as important as the master key with you, Dr. Nash? That's how I work, okay? I needed to have it at hand to properly focus on the problem. Anyway, some heavy drinking followed. I cannot remember much. I may have opened up about my problem to some strangers. I woke up in an alley the next morning with both the master key and my journal missing and the one who took them knew exactly what they could do. And my worst fears came to pass during the gambling showcase tournament. Could you tell us more about what happened? <sighs> Looking back on it, I should have known something was wrong when a total rookie like Noah Buddy decimated his high-ranking opponents against all odds. To think if I had the courage to admit my mistake to Charles that day, all of this could have been avoided. Instead, I held my peace and wished for a miracle. And because of that, I stood witness to Charles being dragged away in handcuffs, while Buddy took over the deck and everything else my friend had built. Charles, of course, was not the only victim. His granddaughter was there the very night they arrested him. And despite all that, you just kept quiet after his arrest? No. That's when I knew I had to tell someone. But I picked the wrong person. I still couldn't face Charles. So instead, I confided in his lawyer, Richard Gunner, about my mistake. If only he could use it to get Charles exonerated. I had already signed myself up as a witness for the defense, but I was told by Gunner not to testify. He said he'd find another way. He promised me I didn't have to face my shame. And that's why the withdrawal request was made? Yes. Originally written and signed by Gunner, and later yours truly, and then verified by the courts. Only now I wish I'd never signed that cursed piece of paper. What was this another way? No doubt you've heard about Gunner's reputation. I couldn't prove it myself at the time, but I was certain that Buddy must have used the master key to tamper with the tables. So, I paid Gunner to procure a full confession from him. Everything I had saved up during my life, gone in an instant. Yet during Charles' trial, I could only watch in horror as his defense all but claimed his guilt and focused on mitigating circumstances instead of innocence. The confession I had been waiting for never arrived, and Charles was found guilty. I'm just glad he didn't have to personally witness that sham of a defense. That must have been hard for you. Understatement of the decade. I was livid. No sooner had Gunner stepped out of the courtroom than I confronted him and asked him why he'd betrayed us. And I'll never forget what he said. Straight to my face, without even flinching, I got offered a better deal. It was really a spur-of-the-moment thing, but I punched Gunner right as he was about to light up, smacked the cigarette right out of his lying mouth, and swore I'd jam it down his throat once the truth was out. Bastard had already been paid more than most people see in a lifetime, 
but even that was not enough to satisfy his greed. It was obvious that House had bought his silence with the deck's enormous fortune. Gunner's goons were on me in seconds, but he just laughed and told them that I was not worth the effort. He even had the gall to place the damn cigarette in my pocket and tell me he'd be looking forward to it. It felt like he enjoyed flaunting what a corrupt bastard he was. And Gunner knew full well I couldn't do anything about it if I valued my own life. He was untouchable. That's what everyone thought at least. Until a few weeks later. You're referring to his fatal accident? Yes. Richard Gunner received a customized sports car as a gift from an unknown benefactor and took it for a test run. Much good that did to him. Heavy rain plus one speeding sports car equals a hunk of junk metal at the bottom of Angel River. But that's basic physics for you. Especially if the brakes happen to fail out of the blue. What exactly are you insinuating? Let's just say someone got very lucky when Gunner took all the dirt they had on them to an early grave. Now all that remains of Richard Gunner is that cigarette butt, which in hindsight is the perfect thing to remember him by. <laughs> Cancerous trash. And while I know I only keep it around for sentimental reasons, the thought of burying this at Gunner's grave after Charles' exoneration has offered me some solace. I can never forgive Gunner for that. That man never atoned for his sins and justice was never served. Because no one believed us. Because people were too busy pointing fingers to seek the truth. And because of Gunner's endless greed, Charles Argyne vanished off the face of the earth. And that vile attorney didn't even have the goddamn courtesy to live with the shame. He let my friend be found guilty for nothing! Charles could be rotting in a shallow grave somewhere, for all I know. And that is why I hate attorneys, Mr. Justice. Well, I can certainly see why he would. Dr. Nash, I can't even begin to tell you how sorry I feel for you. Oh, save your pity. It'll do me no good. I've lost faith in the so-called justice system and learned the hard way that everyone has a price. That's when I understood the rules of this game. These people are not interested in the truth, but rather how you can twist it for your own needs. May this be a cautionary tale for you. Dr. Nash, with all due respect, there are still attorneys out there who value the truth over a favorable verdict. I've always strived for that, and it's never going to change. Is that so? Then I suggest you do the right thing and quit your profession before it turns a naive young thing like you into a villain. I don't think so. As the saying goes, the only way for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. <laughs> I may be inclined to believe you, if only because I could spot your bluffing attempts a mile away. Maybe if someone like you had been there nine years ago, things would have been different. Maybe he could have stood proudly against the odds in court and the company wouldn't have gone under. How come Mr. Argyne was not present at his own trial? Simple. As gambling fraud is not a capital offense, he was allowed out on bail. Charles had always been a better judge of character than I, and despite the fact he was innocent of any wrongdoing, he was exhausted. I guess he'd finally come to terms with the fact that he'd never get a fair trial under the circumstances. So instead of resigning to his fate, he took one final gamble and ran. Just like that? He ran and abandoned everything? No, nothing like that. Before he disappeared, Charles invited me over for one last favor. I'm here, Charles. I came as soon as I got your message. Hector, my dear friend, sit down. I have something important to ask of you. Tomorrow, I will no longer be here, and I need someone I can trust to look after my little angel. What do you mean? The trial's not over yet. We still have hope. Hope? 
I admire your newfound optimism, but the reality is that you and I both know what the outcome will be. There's nothing either of us can do to change that. I... You don't need to say anything, Hector. Just promise me this one thing. Please, take care of my granddaughter after I'm gone. I know it's a lot to ask from you, but you're the sole person I can trust with this. I promise. Thank you. I'm sorry I've put you in this situation, but I can rest easy knowing you'll be there for her. Farewell, Hector. Until we meet again. And that was the last time I ever saw him. To think that I could have told him everything that night. Not doing so has been the biggest regret of my life. Not only had I ruined Charles's life and let his life's work be stolen, I also failed to fulfill his final wish to me. What happened to his granddaughter? She... went into foster care. How could you let that happen? You promised to take care of her! Believe me when I say that I tried my utmost to gain guardianship over her. But I was ultimately rejected. During the interview, it became obvious that I didn't actually know a thing about her other than her name and the fact she dragged that plush toy of hers everywhere. Of course, I couldn't help noticing the little lass whenever she was spending time with Charles. However, he and I limited our topics to work-related matters, so his granddaughter was never brought up. I am not a people person, and he respected that. What I did know was that Charles and her were the last of the Argyne family after her parents tragically died in an accident when she was but a baby. I never asked for the details out of respect. What was her name? Angela Argyne. I wish I knew what became of her, but after I got rejected as a guardian, she got placed in foster care. And, of course, they couldn't disclose where to a complete stranger. Maybe it was for the best. I don't think I could have faced, much less raised her, until I cleared Charles' name. In that case, why didn't you speak up after his trial? Yeah, you could have let the truth be known at any time afterwards. Have you listened to a single word that I've been saying? I had just witnessed my friend's reputation and life's work unjustly destroyed. Yet they were still out for more. With Charles's disappearance, a new scapegoat was sorely needed for the news cycle. And I was not about to throw myself into the grinder just to have his only chance at redemption torn apart. Not when I still had the moral duty to set things right. Over all these years, I've been telling myself that I just need to wait for the right moment. But maybe that's a comfortable lie I've been holding on to. Charles Argyne's name has already been reduced to obscurity. Honestly, I'm not even sure if there's anyone left who cares. Except for me. We care, Dr. Nash. I'm sure his granddaughter does as well. I suppose I'll go against my better judgment and take your word for it, Mr. Justice. Perhaps this is the one shot at fixing the mess I made. The vain hope of a chance like this arriving is why I've stuck with the deck for all this time, even if it is a shadow of its former self. What happened to the deck after House took control? That tyrant's leadership and wanton waste of money didn't win him any favors with the rest of us. Many members resigned in protest, while others were all but forced out for opposing him. This, in turn, caused the number of new members to collapse like a house of cards. Now there's barely enough people to play in the All-Star Legends, and yet House's unbeatable skills still drew more spectators and sponsors every year. I've stayed all this time, <laughs> begrudgingly. In fact, I couldn't leave if I wanted to, as long as House was still in the equation. He was not going to let the last few members of the deck quit, and he no doubt had dirt on all of us to keep us in his grip. I know he's used my connection to Argyne as leverage more than once. 
Despite that, I have attempted to wrestle control of the deck and this casino from him for nearly a decade before he ran it all to the ground. Unfortunately, it would seem that I failed on that front as well. I've concluded there's no winning against that man. Do you think he cheated? If he did, I don't understand how. Even if he had the master key, all of our prototypes were recalled and destroyed in the wake of Charles's verdict. That is a good point. Either way, I couldn't just quit, so I have kept trying. That's everything I can tell you about my past. To be frank, I'm not even sure why I told you all that. It's unlike me to get this emotional. Maybe it's a sign that you're starting to trust us. Likely it's more because of desperation for someone that will listen. But I suppose that makes no difference. You've done me a favor listening to that tirade. So in turn, I'll try and answer any questions you may have about the case. Maybe that way you'll reach the truth you hold so dear. If there's anything at all you can tell us about the events that night, we'd be grateful. Not sure what else I can tell you. The final testimony I gave yesterday is the truth, and I've not omitted a thing. Drat! So much for that. Wait, what about the poltergeist? Maybe Dr. Nash can help with that. What? Oh yes! Mr. Rockwell claimed his room was haunted, and the investigation concluded the damage done to the room's electronics was akin to a lightning strike. Would you have any idea what could be the cause, Dr. Nash? Considering that the supernatural doesn't exist, it sounds like some type of power surge to me. If multiple devices were affected at the same time, I'd say we're dealing with an electromagnetic pulse. Of course, that would require a device capable of generating such a pulse. Don't suppose you found one? Not exactly, but there was something odd present at the scene nevertheless. It's a long shot, but here goes nothing. Could you please also take a look at this? Jeez, what did that plush do to deserve that? We were told that he somehow self-combusted, apparently due to a spark from a short circuit. Sounds unlikely, but let's take a look. Huh. Looks surprisingly well preserved under the charring. Must not have been burning for long. Wait. What the hell? What is it? This is no ordinary plush toy. The inside is state of the art tech. The shielding and other components on this indicate this device is or rather was indeed capable of producing a small EMP. This could definitely have fried any electronics that were not shielded against it. However, there's more. There's also a damn signal jammer inside this thing. A what? Oh, for Pete's sake. Guess I'll have to spell it out for you Luddites. Simply put, it is a device that can be used to interfere with wireless communications. Anything working on a wireless signal would get scrambled as soon as this gets turned on. Say, we found this inside an electronic safe, but there were no signs of forced entry. Is it likely the EMP could have opened the safe? Theoretically, electronic locks tend to pop right open as a failsafe should their circuits fry. But Apollo... If it was inside the safe, how could anyone activate it? Easy. From the looks of it, this thing is also remote controlled. Someone went all in on the bells and whistles. But why would all this be inside, Mr. Pinky? I don't know where you got this, but I'm guessing you didn't pick it up at the casino's gift shop. It's Miss Lucky Garnet's signature plush! Garnets. I see. It's just as I suspected then. What was that? <sighs> Nothing. Listen, you two have given me something to think about. I've told you what I can. Now it's your turn to go and make things right. Thanks for your help, Dr. Nash. I'll be at your disposal should you need me. But for now, I need some time to reflect on things. 
You can trust me to be following the trial closely, Mr. Justice. Hector Nash, I'll not betray your trust! Let's go, Apollo. We have one last witness to confront. The Lady of the Hour herself. Looks like our chat with Hector gave time for the investigators to clear out. Barely a soul around, so Lucky should be easy to find. There she is. Time to ask her some questions. Oh, poor Mr. Pinky. How will I ever manage without you? Um, hi, Lucky. Sorry if we're coming at a bad time. Oh, hey. It's no problem. Back to investigate, are you? We sure are! Her ability to put on that sunny smile so quickly is a little off-putting. I'll happily take you over the police any day. Ever since Mr. Pinky got the spotlight in the trial, they've been turning the backstage inside out. They were poking their noses absolutely everywhere, even in my dressing room. Whatever happened to respecting privacy, hmm? But what can I do for you, lovelies? We've got more questions if you've got the time. Of course. I'll try to help you out. But, frankly, the aftermath of Mr. Pinky's demise has kept me too busy to follow the developments of your case. I'm not sure what else I can tell you. Based on what we know by now, a lot. On that note, I would rather not talk about anything related to Mr. Pinky or his disappearance. If that's all right with you, I'm still in mourning. Hmm. While I would love to hear Lucky explain why Mr. Pinky contained that tech, I shouldn't reveal our hand just yet. Come on, Polly! Don't forget that we'll need to get some evidence to prove Daddy's innocence. Might as well start with that. So about the duffel bag Mr. Wright left here on the night of the murder, is it still here? Oh yes, the one we were talking about earlier. I'm afraid the police have since confiscated it as evidence. Aw, that's too bad. On the upside, I won't have to haul it around everywhere. Are you aware that they found the masked stranger's suit in that bag? I most certainly am, as I was here when they discovered it. It was quite the surprise, to put it lightly. I see. Any idea how the suit ended up in the bag, or how the stranger got backstage? Your guess is as good as mine, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, Lucky, but I can't accept that answer. Excuse me? You're not being honest with us. When the suit was discovered, it was in pristine condition, according to the prosecution. What's your point, Mr. Justice? What was it that you said just the other day? There was a small accident while I was searching for Pinky, and I think I broke a bunch of the bottles. Oh dear, Daddy won't be happy about that. If you were indeed looking for Mr. Pinky as frantically as you claimed yesterday, you would have discovered the stranger's suit as soon as you looked inside Mr. Wright's bag. Furthermore, if the suit had been inside at that point, there would have been juice stains all over it from the bottles you claimed to have broken. That's right! Good catch, Apollo! But that means you lied to us, Lucky. Why would you do that? Okay. Please hear me out before you start jumping to conclusions. I'm sorry. You're absolutely correct. I've been keeping this from you, but I had a very good reason. You see, I was only trying to protect Mr. Wright's secret. Huh? Secret? The truth is, I did find the suit and mask in his bag yesterday when searching for Mr. Pinky. I was shocked to have learned Mr. Wright's secret identity in such a way, and I knew it was up to me to protect it. That's why I had to come up with an excuse not to give you his bag yesterday. I couldn't risk exposing his identity to anyone else. You've got to be kidding me. I've just been waiting for him to pick up the bag. Honest. But I guess the police got to it first, and now it's out there. I'm sure Mr. Wright appreciates the gesture, but Mr. Wright has himself denied being the masked stranger. And I can always tell when Daddy is not telling the truth. 
Oh, well, that makes things slightly awkward. Please forgive me. I really didn't mean to cause any harm. <sighs> I guess that explains that for now. Well, there is something else Lucky should be able to shed some light on. Remember that list, Polly? I suppose we've come this far already. No avoiding it now. I need to confirm whether my hunch is correct. Hopefully she'll not take this badly. Speaking of finding something unexpected, Mr. Pinky was originally a gift from your grandfather. Isn't that so? I believe I already requested you to not ask me about Mr. Pinky. My apologies. I'm actually more interested in hearing about your grandfather. Just what kind of man was he? Oh, that's a personal matter, Mr. Justice. Besides, he died years ago. I don't know why you'd even ask me about this since it bears no relevance to the case. I beg to differ. We have something to show he's important enough to use as a subject for blackmail. You see, we found this list in Mr. House's safe. It has the weaknesses of every member on the deck. And what's listed after your name is your doll. And your family. What on earth are you insinuating? You've already told us that you didn't know your parents. So this no doubt refers to your grandfather. We need an explanation, Lucky. He was clearly someone important to you. There is nothing to explain. Mr. House is dead, and whatever he knew about my family can no longer harm me. Then why aren't you willing to talk about it with us? Because it's simply not relevant. That, and there's too many sad memories involved. She keeps dodging the issue. No way forward but to confront her about it. Well, let me tell you what we think, Lucky. I suspect that if people knew about the connection between you and your grandfather, it would ruin your career in professional poker. Laughable. What would you know? We've looked into the past of Rex House. More precisely, the incident that started everything. It all began when Charles Argyne was convicted of gambling fraud all those years ago. And what does any of that have to do with me? You would know better than anyone else in the world. Because of what happened that day, you lost everything. Your family, and even the very name your parents gave you. After all, Felicia Garnet is not your birth name, is it? Your real name is... Angela. Angela Argyne. <gasps> and if that's so, then your grandfather was none other than Charles Argyne himself! Incredible. I don't know how you pieced it together, but I suppose it's pointless to keep denying it. Yes, the name I abandoned long ago was Angela Argyne, and I'm the granddaughter of the infamous fraud and cheater, Charles Argyne. Well played, Mr. Justice. You've successfully torn open old scars and revealed my shameful secret. I hope you're satisfied with yourself. I'm sorry it had to come to this, but I'm not doing this without a good reason. Holly never meant to hurt you, Lucky. Let's hear it then. Are you going to tell me that my grandfather was a horrible man as well? That he deserved everything that happened and that I was better off growing up without him? Not at all. In fact, we believe he was wrongfully convicted all those years ago. But in order to prove that, we need your help. Hmm. I appreciate the gesture, Mr. Justice. But what's the point? Even if you could prove he's innocent, that case was closed a long, long time ago. All your hard work would only result in someone writing a new page to a dusty folder in a forgotten archive, and the rest of the world would be none the wiser. Do you not want him exonerated? Yeah, of all people, I'd expect you to care. For what I care? Charles Argyne can keep rotting in a hell of his own making. I stopped caring the moment he chose to abandon me in that orphanage. He was all I had. You couldn't imagine what it was like growing up without your parents. But I can, and I do. I... 
I didn't know my parents either. I was raised by a foster father. And I never knew my mother. My biological dad abandoned me when I was young before Mr. Wright took me in. Maybe we haven't walked in your shoes, but perhaps we've been down the same trail. I see. Then, I suppose you just might understand how much it hurts to clutch to the vain hope of seeing your family again. I was too young to grasp just what had happened at the time, and it was only made worse by those who tried protecting me from the truth. My days were filled with activities that reminded me of him. Countless hours of listening to the same jazz tunes we used to back then, and practicing my card skills alone. Every night, I wished upon the starry sky for Grandpa to come get me. It was only years later that I understood what had happened, and the hope I had been holding on was replaced by disgust for his selfishness. That was the day Angela Argyne was buried along with her grandfather, and from her ashes rose Felicia Garnet, free from the binds of the accursed legacy, forever decreed by that fateful New Year's Eve. And on that note, I must insist you don't bring up the name I used to bear again, or reveal my shameful lineage to anyone. Of course, Lucky. Thank you. Having to hold on to the memories of that day burdens me enough as is. What can you tell us about it? To be honest, not a whole lot. I was very young at the time, and overwhelmed by everything that happened afterwards. I couldn't fully appreciate the deepest intricacies of poker at the time, so Grant Charles had given me a disposable camera to snap photos of the venue. If only he had known those photos and Mr. Pinky would end up being my last mementos of him. You held on to the photos? Of course. First as a keepsake. Later as a reminder to myself. This is the last photo ever taken of Charles Argyne. Just before the final round of the tournament was played. It was only hours later that he was arrested and I was taken away. Never to see him again. So that's Argyne shaking hands with Mr. House. Or Mr. Buddy, as he was known at the time. You said you kept this photo as a reminder? Yes. My mission was simple. I was going to surpass Charles Argyne by defeating the man who defeated him. And taking over the deck. If I ever had doubts about my ability... One glance at this photo rekindled the flame that has kept me going. I have since removed his face from the photo for what he did to me. I was not going to let someone like Charles Argyne define me. The only thing he left me was the burden of his accursed name, and I'll never stop hating him for it. I don't think that's true, Lucky. What? You still doubt my resolve? It's not that. I'm just curious that despite being a gift from your grandfather, you've held on to Mr. Panky all this time. You've also made him your signature mascot, and went through so much effort to find him after he went missing. Not to mention the fact that you still have that photo. Hm. If you care about Argyne so much, then you take it. With House's demise, I no longer have any reason to hold on to it. Are you sure? Trust me, you're doing me a favor. It's high time I let go and forget about him for good. Charles Argyne is finally dead to me. But, but... I'm sorry. I think I want to be left alone. I can feel the tightness in my bracelet. Trucy must have noticed it too. Despite what you're saying, you never gave up on him. Did you? Well, well, well. Sorry to crash upon your party, Herr Justice. How about a knock next time? Yeah, you can't just burst in like that! Huh. I can tell from the way you're looking at me that this is a bad time. Guess I'll be back later. Oh no you don't, Clavier! I've got some questions for you! Well, since you insist, Herr Justice. First of all, what are you doing here? Nothing much. Decided to come to take a look around. 
I do wonder what you're going to ask, though. Better make the most of this opportunity! What is this about streaming the trial live? Huh? You're doing what now? You sound surprised. I did tell you that the public is extremely interested in this case, yeah? All that equipment for live broadcast at the crime scene gave me an idea. After all, who am I to deny an audience a performance they yearn for? And I have to say, quite an audience we've gotten. Today, they were more than 100,000 strong, and we're probably going to have even more people tuning in for the finale as the word gets around. More than 100,000 people will be watching? And I don't get a say in this? But you did. You already agreed to it before the trial began. What? When? You signed the papers before you entered the courtroom, didn't you, Head Justice? Uh, oh, so... That's what they were for. Of course. You're a lawyer, Herr Justice. You should know it's worth reading things before you sign them. Ouch! He's really got you there, Polly. <sighs> What's important is that you've been putting on a good show so far. Keep it up, Herr Justice. What is your endgame here? A trial is not supposed to be a spectacle to the public, Clavier! If we lived in an ideal world, I would agree with you. But unfortunately, we need more work to get there. The jurist system is dead and buried, so we have to get creative on how to restore people's faith in our justice system. If the public can see for themselves what really goes on behind the courtroom's doors, they may yet start trusting the courts again. Then why do you go out of your way to make things difficult for us? Because they need to see us ardently fight for the truth, and do so without compromise, if you catch my drift. For one, I knew you'd never settle for less than not guilty for your client, but the public needs to see your conviction themselves. So you must excuse me if I coax out some of that conviction with some unorthodox methods. So, that's what the deal offer was about. Nevertheless, I have faith that you'll overcome these little obstacles in the end, Herr Justice. So, you believe Mr. Porter is innocent? I'll just leave that for the judge to decide. What matters to me is that you believe in his innocence, Herr Justice, even in the face of our most frenetic investigation. With that said, if you wouldn't mind leaving the scene... Hey, we were here first! That's right! Besides, wasn't your team busy turning the backstage upside down earlier? That may be so, but as new information comes to light, so must the focus of our investigation shift also. We will also be taking this lovely Fräulein with us for questioning. We have some questions we want answered. What? From me? What more could she possibly tell you? Oh, her testimony has become critical to this case, ever since we discovered how the stranger escaped. The stranger? What are you talking about? We'll get to that later. Now, come along, Fräulein. We have a lot to talk about. I suppose if we must. I look forward to all this being over. I'll see you in court, Herr Justice. Likewise, Prosecutor Gavin. The Courts of Seal won't rest until this is over! That's what I like to hear. Auf Wiedersehen! And thus, the starlets leave the stage. We should follow suit, Polly. Yes, I guess that concludes our investigation. We have no more witnesses to talk to, and visiting hours at the detention center are already over. Come on, Trucy. Let's head back to the office. To think all of this started over a simple game of poker. They can really be cruel sometimes. All we can do now is to make sure Jack is spared from a similar fate. Thus, the curtain falls for our investigation. We've heard many revelations regarding the AC3 case, and how deeply it has affected the people involved to this day. Even the death of Rex House could end up being one of its many tendrils, rooted firmly a decade in the past. Unfortunately, we enter our final trial day with less evidence than we had hoped, but it can't be helped. For now, we are forced to play the hand we have been given, and leave the rest to fate. <laughs>